For the past several weeks, we have been covering the kidnapping of J.C. Dugard, primarily from her perspective. Today, we are going to take a look at the man who perpetrated this crime against her. Welcome to The Secret Sits. I'm your host, John Dodson. Join us every Thursday as we uncover the secrets behind the world's most fascinating true crime cases. You can find all episodes of The Secret Sits for free on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you are hearing, reach out to us on Instagram and Facebook at The Secret Sits Podcast or on Twitter at Secret Sits Pod. Now, on with our story. Philip Garrido was sometimes referred to as Creepy Phil by those who knew the man. These people considered Philip strange and at times frightening. He was born in Pittsburgh, California on April 5, 1951, and he grew up in Brentwood. Here is where Philip graduated from Liberty High School in 1969. Philip was described by his own father as a good boy, but following a pretty serious motorcycle accident while he was still a teenager, Philip turned to drugs. It is not clear if Philip's drug use was due to him trying to personally manage pain caused by his motorcycle accident or if he just began using drugs recreationally. Philip had a strong proclivity for methamphetamines and LSD. Philip would admit during court proceedings that he regularly sat in his car, close to grade schools, and masturbated while watching girls outside of the school. In 1972, Philip was arrested for raping a 14-year-old multiple times after he gave her drugs to incapacitate her. This young girl declined to testify against Philip at trial, and the DA was forced to drop the charges against Philip. The following year, in 1973, Philip married one of his high school classmates named Christine Murphy. Christine would later accuse Philip of domestic violence, including one time when she attempted to leave the relationship and Philip's response was to kidnap her so she could not leave. In 1976, Philip kidnapped a 25-year-old woman named Catherine Calloway in South Lake Tahoe, California. He drove this woman to Reno, Nevada, and he took her to a warehouse where he proceeded to rape the woman over and over for five and a half hours. A police officer who was patrolling the area noticed Philip's car parked outside of the warehouse. This officer got out of his car to investigate the empty car, and he noticed that the lock on the warehouse door had been busted open. The officer knocked on the door to the warehouse and waited. A disheveled-looking man appeared in the doorway. He told the officer that nothing was wrong. But just then, a distraught woman appeared at the door, asking for the police officer to help her. The officer immediately arrested Philip Garrido. The courts ordered a psychiatric evaluation of Philip, and he was diagnosed as a sexual deviant and a chronic drug abuser. The doctor who evaluated Philip recommended a neurological examination because he believed that Philip's years of abusing drugs could have caused his sexual deviation. Neurologist Albert F. Peterman then took on the case. Dr. Peterman stated that Philip Garrido showed considerable evidence of anxiety and depression and personality disorder. Philip went on trial for the kidnapping and rape of Catherine Calloway on March 9, 1977. He was convicted and given a 50-year sentence to be served at Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas. While serving out his sentence, Philip Garrido met a woman who was at the prison visiting her uncle, who was also incarcerated. This woman's name was Nancy, 
and she liked Philip Garrido right from the start. Philip and Nancy were married at the Leavenworth Penitentiary on October 5, 1981. On January 22, 1988, after serving 11 years of his 50-year sentence, Philip Garrido was released from Leavenworth. But he would not get his freedom yet. Philip was moved from Kansas to Nevada State Prison, where he still had to serve his sentence for his state crimes. Philip was sentenced to five years to life, but he was released from the Nevada State Prison after just seven months. After being released in Nevada, Philip became a federal parolee in Contra Costa County, California. It was here that Philip and Nancy moved to the city of Antioch, California, to live in Philip's mother's home. Philip's mother was elderly and in poor health, suffering from dementia. Philip was ordered to wear an ankle monitor, and he had regular home visits from his parole officers. This is the story of Philip Garrido, prior to our episodes covering the kidnapping of J.C. Dugard. And in our episodes, we told this kidnapping case from J.C.'s perspective. J.C. did not know what was happening in the outside world. She did not know if anyone was even looking for her. So now I am going to tell you more about J.C. Dugard's kidnapping and subsequent escape, with all of the details J.C. had no idea about. We know that J.C.'s mother worked as a typesetter and had left early on a Monday morning for work. J.C. is 11 years old, and she wakes up and gets herself ready for school. As she is walking up the hill from her house to her bus stop, she does not hear the car coming up from behind her. Philip rolled down his car window and used a stun gun to incapacitate the small girl. Philip's wife, Nancy, then dragged J.C. into the car. Nancy covered the girl with a blanket and held her down as she drifted in and out of consciousness. J.C.'s stepfather, Carl Proben, witnessed the couple abduct his stepdaughter from inside of his home. He ran out of the house and attempted to give chase on a bicycle, but he was unable to overtake the car as it sped away. Some of J.C.'s classmates also witnessed the abduction while they were waiting on the bus as well. Police first looked into Carl and then Ken Slayton, J.C.'s biological father, but both men were cleared in the abduction. Just a few hours after J.C.'s kidnapping, local and national media outlets began picking up the story. Within days, many locals had volunteered in the search efforts to find the missing girl. 10,000 flyers and posters were distributed to small businesses all over the USA, and the town blanketed everything that would stand still with pink ribbons, because pink was J.C.'s favorite color. J.C.'s mom, Terry Proben, founded a group she entitled J.C.'s Hope. This group directed the fallen tears and fundraising efforts to bring J.C. home. The group made audio tapes of the song J.C. Lee to hand out, along with t-shirts, sweatshirts, and buttons, which were sold to raise money to make more posters, to pay for postage, and other related expenses. The groups Child Quest International and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children also became involved in the case. The posters and flyers showed that a reward was being offered in the case as well. On June 14, 1991, the kidnapping of J.C. Dugard was covered on an episode of America's Most Wanted. J.C.'s mother, Terry, would push for continuous efforts in the areas of child safety awareness as she continued to fundraise and hold candlelight vigils, marking each anniversary of her daughter's disappearance. Terry knew that she had to keep her daughter's story in the news. I am not going to recount J.C.'s years in captivity here. If you missed our three-part series on her captivity, I would encourage you to go back and listen to those episodes. What I am going to talk about now are the things that took place during J.C.'s imprisonment that she was completely unaware of. 
while still touching on the most pivotal moments of her captivity. Three years into her captivity, on November 13, 1997, J.C. gave birth to her first child. After this, Philip raped J.C. less frequently, and the last time Philip raped her was on the day when she was impregnated with her second child by her captor. J.C. gave birth to her second child on November 13, 1997. J.C. homeschooled her children, even with the little education she had had. After all, she had been kidnapped when she herself was only 11 years old, and she had only been educated in elementary school. Nancy, Philip's wife, was quite jealous of J.C. and her two beautiful little girls, so Philip made J.C. teach her daughters that she herself was actually her own children's older sister rather than their mother, and they all called Nancy their mother if they were ever out in public. Philip Garrido started his print shop, and J.C. acted as the graphic artist for his printing business. One customer of this business, Ben Dodrell, claimed that he spoke to J.C. on the phone and that the printing business did excellent work. J.C. was allowed, after years of imprisonment and grooming, to answer the door to the house. Philip's mother, Pat, who was elderly and in poor health, lived in the house, while J.C. and her kids stayed in the shed and tents in the backyard of the house. In all of the encounters J.C. had in public, she never willingly revealed her true identity to anyone she had met, After all, she had been held captive since she was 11 years old, and her head was filled with Philip and Nancy's lies about the world outside of their home. I want you to remember that Philip was still on probation, and this required regular check-ins from his probation officers. Because of this, law enforcement visited the house several times, but they never checked the property close enough to realize that a woman with her two children were being held captive in a secluded backyard. There were a number of close calls when opportunities arose for others to help J.C. and her children, but all of these would be failures. Police did not put together that J.C. had been taken from a location south of Lake Tahoe. This is in the same vicinity of the Catherine Calloway Hall kidnapping, also perpetrated by Philip Garrido. Police received a call from a concerned citizen on April 22, 1992. This was less than a year after J.C. had been taken. This man called the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office from a gas station located just two miles from Philip Garrido's home. And on this call, the man claimed that he had been inside of the gas station and he saw a poster for the missing girl, J.C. Dugard. But what was truly bizarre is that this man claimed that standing before him was also the actual J.C. Dugard. She was standing there, staring at the missing person's poster, intently staring at the picture of herself. After this, the caller claimed that the girl left in a large yellow Dodge van. The man did not get the plate number of the van as it left, and he did not identify himself during the phone call. When police arrived at the filling station, the girl, the van, and the mysterious caller were all gone. What is strange about this entire story is that a large yellow Dodge van, just as described, was located on the Garrido property. However, J.C. herself has said that she never left the Garrido property from the time she was taken until just before the birth of her first child. Was this all a coincidence or not? Go to our social media and tell us what you think. During June of 2002, the Antioch Fire Department responded to the Garrido's home. The claim was that a juvenile had suffered a shoulder injury while swimming in the pool at the house. This information was not relayed to Philip's parole officer, because if it had been, 
the parole officer knew that there were not any juveniles recorded as living in the home, and they also knew that the Garrido house had no pool. In 2006, a call came in to a 911 dispatch center. This caller stated that they were one of Philip Garrido's neighbors, and they were concerned because they believed children were living in his backyard in camping tents. This caller also expressed concerns because they believed that Philip was psychotic and that he struggled with sexual addictions. In response to this caller, the sheriff's office sent a deputy to the house. This officer spoke with Philip Garrido at the front door of the main house for about 30 minutes. The deputy told Philip that it would be a code violation if there were people living outside on his property. But that was all. He did not go check the property. He did not go look for any erroneous youths lingering around in the backyard. He just left. On August 24th, 2009, Philip Garrido traveled with J.C.'s two young daughters to the FBI field office in San Francisco. While there, he left a four-page essay expressing his own ideas about religion and sexuality. In this essay, he suggested that he had discovered the solution to his past sexual crimes. He described how he had curved his own deviant behavior and he suggested that the same information could be used to cure other sexual predators. Philip's solution was to control human impulses that drive humans to commit dysfunctional acts. Also during this trip, Philip traveled to the University of California, Berkeley. While here, he visited the campus police office because he wanted permission to hold an event for his God's Desire program. He spoke to the school's special events manager, Lisa Campbell, who perceived Philip's behavior as erratic, and she observed the behavior of the small girls as well. She described the girls as sullen and submissive. Lisa asked Philip to make an appointment for the following day, which he did, and he left his name while making this appointment. After Philip had left with the girls, Officer Allie Jacobs ran a background check on Philip Garrido, and she discovered that Philip was a registered sex offender and that he was on federal parole for kidnapping and rape. The following day, Philip arrived back at the campus with the two girls. They had made an appointment for 2 p.m., which was attended by Officer Ali Jacobs. The officer observed the girls, whom she described as pale, as if they had very little exposure to sunlight. Their behavior was also unusual to the officer. After Philip and the girls left the meeting, Officer Jacobs called Philip's paroled office to report her concerns. No one answered the phone at the parole office, so she relayed her concerns via voicemail. After the voicemail was heard by the parole office, two parole officers traveled to Garrido's home that same day. When they arrived at the house, they handcuffed Philip and began searching the house. The only persons located in the home were Philip's wife, Nancy, and his elderly mother, Pat. The parole agents then took Philip from the home and drove him to the parole office. While en route to the parole office, Philip told the agent that the two girls who had been with him during his visit to UC Berkeley were the daughters of one of his relatives and that he had permission from the girl's parents to take them on the trip. As a condition of Philip's parole, he was expressly barred from associating with minors. He was also not allowed to travel more than 25 miles from his home without informing his parole officer, which he had not done for this trip. UC Berkeley is located 40 miles from Philip's home, well outside of his travel limits. Even with both of these parole violations, the parole agents reviewed Philip's file with their supervisor, and then they just drove him back home. They told him he needed to report back to the office the following day to discuss his visit to UC Berkeley in more detail. They also wanted to discuss the two young girls who had been with him on this trip. So as requested, the following day, 
August 26, Philip and Nancy packed everyone into their vehicle, including JC and the two girls, and they headed down to the parole office. When the group arrived at the parole office, the officers separated Philip from the women and the young girls, and they began to try and identify each of the females. JC was still proclaiming that her real name was Alyssa, the name she had been going by for all of the years she had been imprisoned. JC, or Alyssa, told the investigators that the girls were in fact hers, and that she knew Philip Garrido was a convicted sex offender. She told them that he was a changed man and a great person. He was even great with her kids. The two young girls mimicked these same sentiments. As the officers pressed her for more details about her identity, JC became more and more defensive and irritated at the questions. In her mind, the only safe place she knew was with Philip, so she had to fight to keep up the facade they had going. She told the officers that she was a battered wife from Minnesota and that she was staying with Philip and Nancy in order to hide from her abusive husband. Parole officers were interrogating Philip Garrido at the same time JC was being questioned, and they contacted the Concord Police Department. A Concord Police Sergeant arrived at the office and when he entered the room with Philip Garrido, Philip confessed that he had kidnapped and raped J.C. Dugard. After this confession, J.C.'s true identity finally came to light. It is often asked why J.C. never made any attempts to flee. There were so many opportunities when she was out of the house in public or when officers came to the house. But J.C. said, that she did what it took to survive, and that her compassion and willingness to participate in life with her captor were her only means of survival, for her and for her two daughters. JC says that she does not believe she had any form of Stockholm Syndrome. She stated, Stockholm Syndrome implies that hostages cracked by terror and abuse become affectionate toward their captors. Well, it's really, it's degrading, you know? Having my family believe that I was in love with this captor and wanted to stay with him. I mean, that is so far from the truth that it makes me want to throw up. I adapted to survive my circumstance. The Secret Sits will return in just a moment. You obviously love listening to podcasts, but have you ever thought about starting your own? My name is Pat Flynn, and I've been podcasting since 2010 and teaching podcasting since 2012. I've helped tens of thousands of people launch their own podcasts, and the one tool I recommend in all my videos and courses is Buzzsprout. Buzzsprout is the easiest way to launch, grow, and monetize your podcast. They make everything so simple with an intuitive UI, great analytics, and they're backed by a team that cares and wants to help you succeed. So if you wanna start your own podcast and you wanna avoid the headache, head over to buzzsprout.com. That's B-U-Z-Z-S-P-R-O-U-T.com and get started today. She repeatedly stated that as a survival mechanism, many victims are forced to sympathize with their captors. Philip Garrido and Nancy Garrido were arrested right there in the parole office. After J.C. Dugard was found and freed from her life in captivity, the local Contra Costa County Sheriff, Warren E. Rupf, issued a public apology to J.C. and her two daughters during a live press conference. And on November 4th, 2009, the California Office of the Inspector General issued a report that displayed failings by the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation that had contributed to J.C. Dugard's continued captivity. The central finding was that Philip Garrido was incorrectly classified as needing only low-level supervision. All other lapses derived from that one singular mistake. In his report, the inspector general detailed an instance in which a parole agent encountered a 12-year-old girl at the Garrido home 
but accepted Philip's explanation that she was his brother's daughter, and the agent did nothing to verify it. Despite the fact that a call to Garrido's brother quickly verified he did not have any children. The two young girls cried when they learned that their father had been arrested. After all, to them, they had lived a normal childhood. They did not know that their father was a criminal, nor did they know that the way that they had lived thus far was not normal. This case is extremely important for families of long-term missing children because it shows that hope has a reason to be kept alive, even in long-term cases. Elizabeth Smart, another long-term abduction survivor, has stressed the importance of focusing on the future with a positive attitude as an effective approach to accepting what has happened. After Philip and Nancy had been arrested, the police performed a search on their property, or rather, Philip's mother's property. After learning that Philip also had available access to one of his neighbor's homes, they decided to search that home as well. And after all of the police's initial failings in this case, they did not want to leave any stone unturned. So they even searched the home of one of Philip's clients from his printing business. In July of 2011, the Hayward Police Department announced that Philip Garrido had not been eliminated as a suspect and was still a person of interest in the abduction of Michaela Garrett, who had been kidnapped in 1988. Hayward is located just 55 miles from Philip's home in Antioch. Philip was interviewed on August 27, 2009 by the Sacramento station KCRA-TV. In this interview from Philip's jail cell, he told the reporter, In the end, this is going to be a powerful, heartwarming story. Because Philip claimed, My life has been straightened out. Wait till you hear the story of what took place at that house. You're going to be absolutely impressed. It's a disgusting thing that took place with me at the beginning, but I turned my life completely around. On August 28, 2009, Philip and Nancy Garrido pleaded not guilty to the charges of kidnapping, rape, and false imprisonment. District Attorney Vern Pearson and Assistant DA James Clinkchard would prosecute the case. A bail review was held on September 14, 2009. At this hearing, Superior Court Judge Douglas Feemeister set bail for Nancy at $30 million. Philip was on a no-bail parole hold. Also at this hearing, Feemeister granted a request from Philip's attorney for a psychologist or psychiatrist to be appointed in this case and to conduct an evaluation on Philip. On October 29th, a short hearing was held to set a date for the next preliminary hearing, where they would discuss discovery for the case. This hearing was held on December 11th, and Katie Calloway Hall, Garrido's previous rape victim, appeared in the courtroom. She did not speak during the proceedings. On November 5, 2009, the judge ordered the removal of Nancy's defense attorney from the case. This decision was made in review of confidential evidence, which was not disclosed to the public. One week later, the judge appointed an interim attorney for Nancy. Gilbert Maines, Nancy's attorney, appealed the decision and received a favorable ruling by the California 3rd District Court of Appeals on December 15, 2009. On December 22, 2009, the same court gave the El Dorado Superior Court until January 2010 to respond to the ruling. Both Gilbert Maines and Stephen Tapson appeared at the discovery hearing on December 11, 2009. Another hearing was held on January 21, 2010. At that hearing, Maines was removed from the case and Tapson was appointed defense counsel for Nancy. At a press conference on February 28, 2011, Tapson said that both Nancy and Philip Garrido had made full confessions in the case. This development came as lawyers for both sides reopened discussions on a possible plea deal 
that had the potential to prevent the need for a trial. Nancy's attorney acknowledged that she was facing eight months to life and that he was working for a reduced sentence in the 30-year range. He stated that the prosecutor had acknowledged that Philip was a master manipulator and that Nancy was under both his influence and the influence of controlled substances during the period of J.C. Dugard's kidnapping. The attorney said Nancy should receive some consideration and alluded to parallels between Nancy and kidnapping victim Patty Hurst, whose case we covered on Season 1 of The Secret Sits. He also made mentions of Stockholm Syndrome. During the actual proceedings of this case, which took place on April 7, 2011, both Philip and Nancy pleaded not guilty, which shocked everyone. Philip's attorney made some arguments about improper selection pertaining to the jury selection, but it did not change the course of this case. Ultimately, on April 28, 2011, Philip and Nancy pleaded guilty to kidnapping and rape by force. Philip was given a sentence of 431 years to life in prison. Nancy was sentenced to 36 years to life in prison. Both parties would be eligible for parole in August of 2034. Philip was sent to the California State Prison, and Nancy is serving her time at the Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla. You can also listen to our episode covering the Chowchilla school bus kidnappings, which we also covered in Season 1. J.C. Dugard declined to attend the sentencing hearings, and instead, she penned a letter and sent it with her mother, who read the letter aloud in the courtroom. J.C. Dugard sued the state of California because the state was responsible for monitoring Philip Garrido while he was on parole for the 1976 rape. And he was still on parole at the time of her kidnapping. She sued the state because of the multiple mistakes made by law enforcement officers during her captivity Mistakes that, if avoided, could have resulted in her discovery and recovery. In July of 2010, the state of California agreed to a settlement with J.C. Dugard in the amount of $20 million. This payment was meant to compensate her for various lapses by the corrections department that contributed to J.C.'s continued captivity, ongoing sexual assault, and mental and or physical abuse. This settlement was agreed to by the California State Assembly in a 70-2 vote. And what two asshats voted against this tortured girl? The California State Senate also had to vote on approving the settlement, and that vote was 30-1. to The bill attached to the settlement was signed by then-California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, on July 9th. J.C. Dugard then went on to sue the United States of America on September 22, 2011. She filed this suit in the United States District Court for the Northern District of California. In this suit, she accused the USA of failing to monitor Philip Garrido when he was on federal parole, which he had been when she was kidnapped. J.C. stated in her lawsuit that the parole officers should have revoked Philip's parole and returned him to prison for a myriad of different parole violations that took place even before she was taken on that distant Monday morning. On March 15, 2016, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit dismissed J.C. Dugard's civil claims under the Federal Tort Claims Act in a two-to-one decision authored by Judge John B. Owens. The court ruled that the federal government's sovereign immunity was not waived because the U.S. is only liable in the same manner and to the same extent as a private individual under like circumstances, under state law. In this case, because the U.S. would not be liable under California law, J.C. could not prevail on her FTCA claim. 
The majority's rationale was that Dugard had not been victimized by Philip Garrido at the time he was placed under federal parole supervision, and there was no way to anticipate she would become his victim. And thus, federal authorities in California had no duty to protect her or other members of the general public from him. Chief District Court Judge William Smith again dissented, stating that he believed that the majority misinterpreted California law, as the cases cited by the majority only involved FTCA liability in rehabilitation centers, and there was no good legitimate grounds to hold the government liable. Today, the Garridos are in prison, where they belong, and J.C. Dugard is attempting to live the best life that she can with her two daughters. She remains a pretty private person who wouldn't be after suffering the unimaginable things she endured in the most formative years of her life. So I want to leave you with this. We dance round in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. If you ever see a situation that you think is strange, say something. If your gut tells you that something is wrong, follow that instinct. Maybe, just maybe, you can save someone else from the worst day of their lives. The Secret Sits podcast is researched and written by me, John Dodson. Audio engineering by Gabriel Dodson. Original logo artwork provided by Tony Leigh.